for inviting me to speak at this uh, occasion. Um, so the uh, okay. So let me start. The first half of the talk is going to be extremely non-technical, and uh, there's only going to be sort of new or new-ish results uh, towards the end. Um, and the the sort of general context here is to analyze uh, problems that show up in probability, but they actually, as you see, they also show up, similar kind of problems show up in quantum field theory, where uh, you have somehow natural approximations to an object, but if you naively somehow look at the natural approximations, it looks like they diverge, and, and so you have to deal with this. And, and originally, as I was mentioned, there was this kind of phenomenon did actually show up when people started developing quantum field theory back uh, basically 100 years ago. And, you know, so they did what you usually do is you sort of guess the form of a Lagrangian or so. In that particular case, you already had a Lagrangian. Um, and then you, you know, you try to build a physical theory and basically, what's a physical theory, right? So, the, so it's sort of important to keep in mind that, you know, a theory is basically a cooking recipe to produce predictions for a physical experiment, right? So you do an experiment, you make some measurement, the measurement is a number, and you have some kind of cooking recipe that produces the number from some mathematical model, and you want the two to fit. Now, typically, your physical theory depends on a whole bunch of parameters, right? It doesn't come as one theory. It comes really as a family of theories that depends on a whole bunch of parameters. And the parameters can be things like, you know, you give them names. It's like mass of the electron, charge of the electron, like these sort of things. Um, and, and then what you really do is you, you know, you make measurements, you make predictions for different types of experiments, and then you sort of fit. And at some point, you've made enough measurements to actually determine all the parameters in your theory, and only then you can actually make real predictions, right? Uh, so the reason why that's important is that one thing to keep in mind is that if a physical theory has infinitely many parameters, then it basically has no predictive power, right? Because you will never be able to actually fix the parameters, and so it's not a physical theory, okay? So that's sort of something to keep in mind. Um, and so in this particular case, in quantum electrodynamics, in a way, the cooking recipe, and that, that's the other thing which is important, is that a theory, you, you, you'd be tempted to think of it as a, some kind of a function, somehow, right? Well, well, the input is somehow the measurement that you take, uh, and the output is a real number, or maybe a probability or something. Um, but, but in practice, it's really more of a cooking recipe of how to compute the function. Right? It's sort of more than just a function in the abstract sense of just a sort of mapping. Um, and so in this particular case, the cooking recipe uh, basically gives you answers in, you know, as a power series um, in powers of a parameter, which is called the fine structure constant. Um, and then there's sort of comp complicated recipes to compute the coefficient of in front of each one of the powers. And so what people did in the beginning is they said, well, okay, so there's these super complicated expressions. Let's just look at the first one. Right? Okay, so that works relatively well. And then what Oppenheimer actually was, as far as I know, the first to realize back in the late 20s, uh, 1920s, um, was that if you look at the next term, um, you know, so there were some measurements that were not explainable if you want. Some experiments were not explainable by the dominant order, so you wanted to go to the next order. Uh, and what you found then is that actually if you apply the cooking recipe that you've sort of derived, um, it actually just gives infinity for the coefficient in front of the second term in the power series. And that's of course nonsense, right? And so then there's nothing to match. And if the theory just predicts infinity, then you know, you're dead in the water somehow. Um, and then, you know, people in the beginning, of course, they say, well, what's that? I mean, you know, you have to sort of restart from scratch. It's all just nonsense. Um, but then what people figured out, and, you know, like here you have, you obviously recognize a number of these names, probably about at least half of them got a Nobel Prize. Um, so 
what they figured out is that essentially you can sort of pretend that these infinities are finite and you basically just take them as parameters in your theory and you're going to be fine. Right? Um, but you have to be a little bit consistent right? in the sense that you know, imagine that your cooking recipe asks you at some point to compute the integral of some function that actually diverges, right? So you have a, I don't know, one of absolute value of x kind of function and you're supposed to compute the integral, of course that's infinity. Um, you could say, well, I don't care, I just pretend it's finite, I put this as a parameter in my theory. And then at some other point you have another function that diverges, um, you know, you say, okay, I put an extra parameter. Now if you have too many of those, you have exactly that problem that you start to have a whole pile of parameters and you're never able to actually determine the theory. Um, so, so what you want is to be sort of consistent. So you say, well, if at some point I have this function that has a non-integrable singularity and then at some other point I encounter another function which is maybe not the same function, but the way it diverges is exactly the same, then you would say, well, maybe the difference of the two functions is actually integral and then you would want the two infinities to be sort of the same Right, the two values to be the same, except that the difference between them should be fixed and should be, you know, equal to somehow the diff the integral of the difference between the two functions, which is integral. Right, like these kind of consistency rules, uh, you would want to, you know, fix them in order to like reduce the number of parameters in the theory. And then, you know, if you're lucky, you actually still have only finitely many parameters, and you actually end up with a real theory. Uh, of course, it sounds sort of dodgy, right? Um, and people were not terribly happy about this. Right? So here is a, a quote by Dirac at the time who said, this is not just, just not sensible mathematics. Sensible mathematics involves neglecting a quantity when it's small, not neglecting it just because it's infinitely big and you don't want it. Right? Um, you know, seems reasonable somehow. Uh, and you know, even Feynman somehow said, the shell game we call, that we play is technically called randomization. But no matter how clever the word, it's still what I would call a DP process. And so, you know, so people came up with this as a kind of cooking recipe, right? It works, uh, it gives you a theory, in principle you're happy, but somewhere you're still not terribly happy because it sounds like a very strange way of proceeding. Uh, but it really works, right? I mean, like, it's the sort of recipe that in some sense you apply when you make predictions for experiments in CERN or things like that and then you know the outcomes are super precise and you can verify them to a ridiculous number of digits. Um, now yes. Well, okay, I mean, here it's, here it's relatively clear, right? You make an experiment, you do something, you, you have some way of producing a number from an experiment. It's not, yeah, I, I don't think I want to go into sort of philosophical discussions at this stage, okay? Uh, so, <laughs> um, so, so in the, right, so if you go back right, to, to what I mentioned on the previous slide about these power series, right? So now what you can do, you do the following thing, is you somehow first fix the degree at which you're going to truncate your power series. You say, you know, I go to degree five or something. Um, and then you do this thing about sort of throwing away infinities and so on in a consistent way. And then you somehow get a theory, right? Um, that's not necessarily the same as somehow keeping the full power series and then figuring out a way of, if you want, making all the terms finite separately and getting a theory, right? So what people do is the first one, right? The second one, typically you don't know how to do it because you might end up with something where the series still doesn't converge, okay? even if each term is finite. Right? Um, so they do the first thing, sort of in quantum field theory, which is you fix the order of the perturbation. Uh, then even at fixed order, you have these infinities that show up. You fiddle around to kind of remove the infinities uh, in a way that I kind of vaguely uh, explained. Um, and, you know, then you 
uh, end up with a theory that has finitely many parameters. You kind of match it to experiments. But the idea is always that's somehow not the real theory. It's somehow just some kind of approximation at some fixed order to the real theory, which you don't really know what it is. Um, but let me just give you like now a more formal kind of cartoon of what's actually happening. Um, and then I want to give you, you know, several number of examples, you know, of actual mathematical examples of where the same sort of phenomena shows up, right? Um, so here is a mathematical cartoon of what, uh, you know, physical model. You can think of it as basically uh, a function that has two types of parameters. The first one is the parameters of the model, like charge of the electron, electron stuff like that. The second one is, you know, some space of physical experiments, right? You, you tell the model what experiment you're doing and it spits out a prediction and the prediction still also depends on the various parameters in the model, okay? So that's kind of a model. Um, and, and now you end up in this situation where if you kind of naively follow the cooking recipe of your model, it gives you kind of infinite values. And, and so one way of fixing it is you sort of figure out what actually creates these infinities. So in quantum field theory, typically what happens is that it's somehow the, the problems arise somewhere at very small scales. It's like if you look at what happens at very small scales, uh, things actually diverge. And, and so what you do is you just int introduce some kind of cutoff parameter, right? So in the analogy of the uh, computing the integral of a divergent function, if it just has a, you know, a well-defined divergence at one point, then you can just say, well, I chop off the function when it becomes bigger than one over epsilon, or somehow I take a little ball of radius epsilon and I kind of make it constant in that ball or something like this, and then it becomes integrable. It's just the integral is very big, right? Um, so you introduce some uh, parameter epsilon, and, and so now you have this kind of approximate theory, which it depends on your parameter, and now it also depends on additional like unphysical parameters which is somehow you know you have you, you've made some sort of cutoff and so you have to decide what you actually do right there are many different ways of cutting things off um, and so that gives you kind of additional parameters which are all the possible choices if you want of regularizing your theory or cutting things off um, and then, then you want to send epsilon to zero. And of course you can't, right? I mean, like what we just said, the whole point is that the thing diverges. And so that's why you introduce the epsilon in the first place. Um, but now what you can do is, well, in, in basically all cases, well, there's always somehow a group that acts on the, these uh, parameters of your theory. For example, just, you know, you can always re-parameterize everything. You can have those like the largest group that acts is just a group of all reparameterizations, but often there are kind of more natural uh, ones that act on this um, set of parameters. And now what you do is as you send epsilon to zero, you simultaneously somehow reparameterize your theory, okay? So in other words, as epsilon goes to zero, you want to find a sequence of group elements in that group that acts here on the parameters of your theory, which is such that if instead of uh, just sending epsilon to zero, I do this kind of simultaneous limit. So I send epsilon to zero, but I also act with this element right, on my parameter, and that element, that action depends on epsilon as well, and it might somehow diverge as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and then it may be that if you do that, you can actually get a finite limit. Okay? I mean, a priori, there's no reason why that would happen, right? I mean, it's a bit of a miraculous thing. Um, but it may happen. And if that happens, and furthermore, right, so what would be even nicer is if you could do it in such a way that you get a finite limit, which is independent of all these unphysical choices that you've made about, you know, how do you somehow regularize your theory, right? I mean, that would be great because then you have something which is sort of canonical because it doesn't, right? It was obtained by some funny way of changing the theory by regularizing and so on. But then you've removed the regularization and you, things don't actually depend on how uh, you regularized it. And so if this happened, then you would be pretty happy somehow, right? And, 
And the point is that this is actually what happens, right? So it's, it's a bit, it seems a bit miraculous because there's no a priori reason for something like this to happen. And what I want to do is I want to kind of show you several, you know, actual mathematical problems where exactly this phenomenon happens. Um, and the outcome here, right, is that the, at least as long as things don't end up being too degenerate, at, at the end of the day, you see in this, uh, in this procedure, you still end up with a, with a model that has the same, right, like the set of parameters here was actually, the space of parameters was kind of the same as the one you started from. And it's just that you've done this kind of reparameterization, which is divergent in a way, uh, but still at the end of the day, you end up with the same parameters as the one that you started from. So that's somehow in, in physics term, there's somehow this thing about dressed parameters and bare parameters, which is basically refers to that. Um, so, so the moral here is that in a way, the form of the model that you started from matters, but you know, the fact that the constants that show up in it are finite is actually not as important as you might think uh, in the first place. Um, and so for example, Toft, uh, he, like the reason he got the Nobel Prize was to basically show that this proce procedure works for the standard model at kind of finite order of perturbation theory. And standard model is sort of the theory of everything, if you want, that describes uh, basically anything except for gravity. Okay, so now here is an actual math thing, right? So if you don't care about the whole uh, physical, philosophical blah, blah, you can wake up now and there's an actual piece of math which you don't need to have followed anything uh, up to now to follow. Uh, so here's an example where the same sort of thing happens. And it's really just about one dimensional Schwarz distribution, right? So Schwarz distribution over R, uh, so the simplest sort of thing you can imagine. And, um, well, now, the idea is, well, try to define a distribution that kind of corresponds to the function 1 over absolute value of x. Right? Now, 1 over absolute value of x, or say a over absolute value of x. Now, of course, normally the way you turn a function into a distribution is you just integrate that function against the test function. Now, 1 over absolute value of x is, of course, not integrable. Uh, so you can't integrate it against arbitrary test functions. You can integrate it against test functions that vanish at the origin. So it's actually already uh, pretty rigid, right? But you can't integrate it against arbitrary test functions. Um, and so you could say, well, maybe somehow I can compensate for that singularity I have at the origin by subtracting, you know, like a very large multiple of a delta function at zero like an infinite multiple of a delta function at zero, okay? Um, and it turns out you can do that, right? Because how do you, oh, what was that? Why does it, why did it just get blank? Okay, uh, Acrobat doesn't like my file. <laughs> Now it works somehow. Strange. Okay, so, right, so we do exactly the thing that I mentioned earlier, right? So, so one thing we can do is, well, the one over x diverges, right? So one thing you can do, you can replace x by x plus epsilon, right? Absolute value of x by absolute value of x plus epsilon. So now it's nowhere zero, so one over that is perfectly fine. There's no divergence anymore. Um, and so you can look at, you know, this distribution here. Um, and now what we do, right, remember, so what's our space of parameters now? Our space of parameters is basically R2. It's, there are two constants here. It's A and C, right? So that's these two parameters that we have in our space, right? So you think of it as that being like the parameters of your theory and you think of the test function for the distribution as being your physical experiment, and testing the distribution against the test function, right, is sort of like the map that kind of produces the, out, the you know, prediction for the experiment, right? So that's the analogy with the previous slide. Um, so, so now what we want to do is we want to sort of uh, 
reparameterize things in the following ways. We would want to essentially change the origin uh, for the second constant, so for the constant C, in an epsilon-dependent way, as epsilon goes to zero, in such a way that there's a cancellation that happens and you get something finite, right? So, so here what happens is you could look at this distribution here, so the eta epsilon, which is, well, the first bit is exactly just the, you know, A over X plus epsilon. Then here there is the just constant times delta at the origin. And then I add this extra term where I just subtract, I take any bump function here, which is one near zero and then zero, you know, sufficiently far away. Um, and I subtract here from phi of x this multiple by, of phi of zero. So now this here is just a fancy way, right? It's, at the end of the day, this is just some constant depending on epsilon times phi of zero, right? So actually I could have incorporated this simply into the last term, right? So this way of writing it in a way is really just a reparameterization of my space, right? The space of pairs A and C where I say, well, the, the C guy, I just shift it by, by this amount, right? which is the integral A times the integral of chi of x divided by x plus epsilon. Okay? So all I do is I reparameterize and I sort of shift the second coordinate by that amount. But now it's obvious here that as epsilon goes to zero, things are perfectly fine. Right? So this perfectly converges as epsilon goes to zero because the uh, numerator here vanishes um, at least linearly at the origin and so dividing it by absolute value of x still gives me something bounded which is perfectly integrable and there's absolutely no problem, right? So I can send epsilon to zero, everything's perfectly fine. Um, and furthermore, you can see, you know, it's kind of clear that if I replaced, instead of replacing absolute value of x by absolute value of x plus epsilon, if I had replaced it by, I don't know, square root of x square plus epsilon square or, you know, whatever, you know, I get the same thing. Right? Obviously. Now, on the other hand, it's not completely canonical, right? Because here there was a choice, which is this cutoff function chi here. Uh, and if I change this cutoff function a little bit, um, I would actually get a slightly different limit, right? But the two limits, they would only differ by some multiple of phi of zero, which can be absorbed in the last term anyway, right? So, if you want the uh, space of models that I get in the limit is canonical, but the parametrization of that space of model is not canonical here, okay? So that's somehow the important thing. So in that particular case, in some sense, your space of model is sort of an affine space, uh, or it's sort of half of a vector space. So for A, there is an origin, but for C, there isn't a canonical origin, right? So it's kind of an affine space and not a linear space. And sort of choosing the origin here is there's no canonical way of doing it. Okay, so that's kind of the important take-home message. And that, that's something that actually happens uh, quite often in this business, right? It's like as you do this whole thing, you end up with a family uh, of possible models and you may lose the fact that the parametrization of that family is canonical, right? You may have a non-canonical parametrization of the family, even though the family is itself is canonical as a family of models. Okay, so now here's a like, completely different example, but you see that actually the same sort of thing happens here. And, and this has like nothing to do with quantum field theory, a priori. Um, so take a random walk. So if you take a random walk and you make the steps very small, and you make the steps very fast. So in some sense, you do steps every epsilon time, uh, and the size of the steps is typically square root of epsilon. Then if you send epsilon to zero, it converges to a continuum uh, object called Brownian motion, uh, which is basically just a random continuous function. Right? So that's a sample of Brownian motion, or if you want here is a sort of more... Uh, so that's a sample of Brownian motion. So, it's, so a Brownian motion is a random continuous function, here, what I've done is I sort of draw one of these random continuous functions, and then I actually kind of zoom out. I fix that function, and I sort of zoom out more and more, and you see it always looks the same. Um, and this parabola here 
is just to say that the way I'm, fixing, I'm zooming out is the way that fixes that parabola. So if you zoom by a certain factor horizontally, you have to zoom by the square root of that factor vertically, okay? Uh, so that's Brownian motion. It's sort of a random continuous function. And clearly, what this movie suggests is that basically at every point, the function has like a square root type singularity. Right? So this is kind of what you see because you, you know, it's essentially tangent uh, to that parabola and that it's sort of translation invariant, so this is true at every point. Right? Uh, so it has sort of square root type singularities everywhere. Um, and so now, you know, one of the you know, things that you do with Brownian motion is you use it it's a very sort of canonical and somewhat universal uh, model for a random continuous function. So it's actually the basics for modeling uh, things like asset prices in math finance. Um, but of course, an asset price always stays positive, right? I mean, once it gets negative, it's the company's bust, basically. And then, uh, then you stop pricing it. Uh, so, so a model of an asset price, right, if you want like a recursion in terms of random walks, the natural thing would be like a random walk, but which is more sort of multiplicative rather than additive, right? I mean, in the sense that it's also natural that if a stock price is worth 100 euro, then within a day it might fluctuate by about one or two euros, whereas if it's worth one euro, then it would fluctuate by one or two cents, right? So somehow typically the size of the fluctuations is about proportional to the value of the stock itself. Um, so, so this is somehow a much more natural model for, for sort of discrete model for stock prices. And now you can ask yourself, well, okay, so if you take that discrete model, right, so this discrete model, when I send epsilon to zero, it converges to a brand new motion. This discrete model here, well, what does it converge to as epsilon goes to zero? Well, I can rewrite this suggestively like this, right? So like over every little time increment, the corresponding increment in my asset price is equal to the asset price itself times the corresponding increment of that random walk up there, okay? Now that looks basically like an ODE, right? If I divide by delta T on both sides. Uh, so this looks like an approximation to this ODE. And now if W is a smooth function, I can solve this ODE and the so solution is always at zero times, you know, exponential W. Um, and so you would think that, well, if this guy converges to W uh, and this guy, say, S of zero is one, then this guy should converge to exponential W, okay? And that's not true, right? So what actually happens is that it converges to exponential of W minus T over two. And, you know, one way of guessing that it doesn't converge to exponential W is you can just look at the expectations on both sides, W at time T uh, is a Gaussian with variance T, uh, and the expectation of E to the Gaussian with variance T is E to the T over two. Um, whereas, you know, if I take this little asset price model, because the increments over every time interval are independent of the increments that come before, you can actually easily see that the expectation doesn't change. Uh, and so if you start at, ex at one, the expectation stays one for all time, whatever your step size, and so even in the limit, it should be something that has expectation one for all times. And so here, of course, if I divide by e to the t over two, well, the two expectations cancel out, and I do indeed get something that is ex expectation one, <coughs> right? So, it's, so somehow this seems more, not, it seems reasonable that this would be the limit, and that is what the limit is, but on the other hand, it seems bizarre because this looks like an approximation to this differential equation, and that differential equation would, you know, predict something different. Um, and so what actually happened here? Well, the, the problem is precisely this fact that, well, this Brownian motion is not a smooth function. Right? So it's, uh, we've seen that at every point it has sort of like square root singularities, and so even though the W converges to a limit, and actually DW to, by DT, of course, in a distributional sense, it also converges to a limit because you can differentiate distributions. Uh, well, you can't multiply distributions. So like sort of, because in my differential equation, I had something like an S times DW by DT, and S itself would look like W because 
we see that it should look like e to the w or something. Um, and now there's a general theorem that says that if you have a function in a distribution, uh, the product is well defined and they are, have some holder regularity if you want. And so here the distribution would be the derivative of Brownian motion, which has regularity basically minus a half, so slightly below, because Brownian motion has regularity a half. It's, we see, we've seen that has these sort of square root singularities at every point. Um, and so this product is well defined if and only if the sum of these regularity exponents is strictly positive. Yeah? And here we're basically just borderline in the sense that Brownian motion itself has regularity sort of a half, actually just not quite. So if you, the actual modulus of continuity is something like a you know, square root of delta log delta. Um, but the, uh, and its derivative has regularity minus a half or actually just not quite. And so you're actually exactly in the case where this alpha plus beta is just slightly negative instead of being just slightly positive. So you're actually on the wrong side uh, of that theorem. And so that theorem doesn't apply and that theorem is really kind of sharp. Um, and so, so here you're really in this situation where that product isn't continuous. Um, and what it means here is that, well, actually, depending on how, how you approximate that product, you get different answers. And so in particular, if you take that ODE, you know, ds by dt is equal to s times dw by dt, there are various ways of approximating that ODE, and these different ways of approximating it give you different limits. Um, but it turns out that if you do it, at least if you approximate things in a way that's sort of time homogeneous, more or less, then the limits that you get will always be of this form. So you get, you end up with different constants here, right? So in the previous slide, the constant we ended up with was a half. You can end up with different constants, but it would always be of this form, right? So you don't have, it's not like you can get anything. Yeah? Um, and so the, so the moral of the story here is that when you, in probability theory, if you sort of have this very, quite singular objects and you kind of approximate them in different ways, then the details of the approximation might matter, but they typically, it doesn't matter too much, right? So maybe it matters in the sense that it uh, changes the values of some constant or changes the, like if you sort of take a whole family of um, these uh, probabilistic objects, then maybe it changes the parametrization of the family but it doesn't actually change the family itself. Right? So in, in exactly the same way as what we've seen, um, well, in the example of quantum field theory. Um, okay, so, so now, so this of course is all, you know, stuff that had been understood almost a century ago. Well, maybe not quite for Brownian motion, but at least more than half a century ago. Uh, and so now I want to talk about recent stuff but where you have the same, the same kind of phenomenon happening, okay? And so the model uh, that I want to talk about here is essentially what's like a natural, uh, you know, like a natural random evolution for a rubber band. Or if you want, you know, you take a Riemannian manifold and you want, you take a loop on that Riemannian manifold, so a smooth function, or say a continuous function from the circle into the Riemannian manifold. And now what's a natural evolution on loops? Okay, so from a deterministic point of view, a natural evolution, well, of course there are several natural evolutions, but one of the simplest natural evolutions is the heat equation. So you essentially just take the gradient flow of the Dirichlet energy, okay? So what that does is it just does that, right? So like here you have a, your manifold is a two-dimensional sphere, you loop, you started off with some kind of spiky thing, um, and then under the heat equation, well, you're trying to minimize here the Dirichlet energy, so you're essentially trying to minimize the length, uh, and so the thing is kind of trying to, shrinking more and more, eventually it shrinks to kind of a small circle that then sort of goes down to a point, right? Um, if you have a more complicated manifold, uh, you might shrink down to an arbitrary sort of closed geodesic, okay? Um, so, so that's the, uh, deterministic part of evolution. Okay. Right, and so that's what I wrote here. So, so here this kind of 
this Laplacian here with a double bar is just, it's a nonlinear term actually, so it's a nonlinear Laplacian if you want, where it's just the thing that the deterministic evolution that I just showed you a movie of gives you, okay, which is basically heat equation plus some nonlinear correction to it, okay, which involves the metric. Um, and now what you want to do is you want sort of the natural random evolution. And so you would want to make the thing as random as possible in a way that is, you know, sort of only uses the Riemannian structure of your manifold. So, so then the natural thing to do is to add to the right-hand side white noise. So xi here denotes, if you want, space-time white noise. So it's like a, um, it's a random Gaussian distribution on space-time. So on both space here would be the one parameter that parameterizes your loop. Time is time. Um, so it's a random distribution on space-time, uh, which has as a covariance a delta function in space and delta function in time. Right? So morally, uh, think of it as being just independent random variables at every point in space-time. Right? So if the thing was discretized, then you would just put independent random variables at every point uh, in your discretization. Um, and this you would want to multiply it by the square root of the inverse of the metric, which, you know, if you just sort of think of it, you want something that actually gives you a vector field and you want something which is if you want round uh, in the intrinsic coordinates of your uh, Riemannian manifold. And if you think about it a little bit, that's somehow the correct thing to put here. Um, in local coordinates, it will give you something like this. Okay, so somehow the first, so here you see the heat equation part and then there's this additional nonlinear term which makes it uh, covariant with respect to changes of coordinates. So the heat equation itself is not covariant uh, under changes of coordinates. But if you add a term like this, where these guys are the Christoffel symbols uh, for your metric, um, then, well, this, this guy here is actually covariant under changes of coordinates. And then the noise here would be, well, what's the square root of the metric? Well, a choice of square root is basically you choose a bunch of vector fields so that the metric, well, actually, I should have written inverse metric. So the inverse of the metric is given by the sum of sigma i tensor sigma i, right? So the, the metric lives in cotan, it's a bilinear form on the tangent space, so it lives in cotangent space tensor cotangent space, uh, but the inverse of the metric lives in tangent space tensor tangent space. Uh, and so you can write the inverse of the metric as a sum of vector fields, okay? So in general, locally, you can, of course, choose as many sigma i's as the dimension of your space. Uh, globally, you can't do that in general if you want them to be smooth on the whole manifold, but you can always do it by taking a bit more, right? So I, I allow here to have more sigmas than the dimension of your, uh, of your manifold. Okay, so then somehow the natural th evolution to look at, at least formally, should be this stochastic PDE. Um, and then the question is that, you know, does that actually mean something? So the, the problem, right, like the first thing is a perfectly nice parabolic PDE. Um, you know, as we've seen in the simulation, right, things, even if you start from something not very smooth, it instantly becomes smooth. Uh, there's absolutely no problem in interpreting that. The problem is that these guys are very singular, right? So like this is, white noise, so it somehow has delta functions as its correlations. Um, if you think in terms of actual regularity, these psi's, they basically belong to C minus 3 half minus, right? In the same sense that the, uh, in one dimension, the time derivative of Brownian motion basically had regularity minus 1 half. So these guys have regularity minus 3 halves. And so it means that the best you can hope for the U itself is to have regularity just below my one half because the heat equation improves regularity by two degrees. And minus three half plus two gives you one half. Um, and so now you see you're, you're far below. Remember in the previous slide, we were sort of on the borderline of that theorem about when does the product of a functional distribution make sense. And we saw that already that theorem is really sharp because when we were at the borderline, we already saw an effect, right? 
So here you're way below the borderline because here you're trying to multiply a function of regularity one half with a distribution of regularity minus three half. So you're one whole derivative below the borderline. Um, and then here it's, you know, you're taking, so the dxu, of course, if u has regularity one half, then dxu would have regularity minus a half, right? So it would be a distribution. And so here you're actually, it's worse because you're just multiplying two distributions. Um, and so then if things go really well, maybe you get another distribution at best of regularity, maybe minus one, because, you know, think of this as at every point having a singularity of order minus a half. If you have functions with singularity of order minus a half and you multiply two of those together, you get a singularity of order minus one, right? Uh, and then still that thing which you don't know how to define gets multiplied by this guy, which itself has only regularity a half. So even if you had this product well defined, you still, you know, that other product wouldn't be well defined, right? So you're sort of way below uh, what, what these sort of general continuity theorems tell you. And so it's really not clear at all that this thing makes any sense, right? In the sense that uh, if you just take some natural approximation of that by just smoothing out the noise and trying to take limits, it just wouldn't converge in general, okay? So, um, uh, but, but actually, so in the sphere, you can just stick it in a computer and it's fine. Uh, so that's actually just, you know, by, here this is what you do by just naively discretizing that thing and not worrying about anything. It seems perfectly fine, right? Uh, so, you know, so clearly actually it does converge in that case. But now why, why does it actually converge? Um, now, there's a sort of general theorem here. Um, so, so that, I, I don't want to spend too much time on how, how you prove that, but of course, you know, proving that was a long effort. So here, it's sort of a, uh, there's a series of papers with various co-authors uh, over a number of years. Um, but by now, there's basically a kind of quite general theory which applies not just to that equation, but to other types of equations like that. Um, and there's a sort of really quite general framework that you can put that in. And it tells you the following. So here, what you do is in general, uh, you want to actually add an extra vector field to the right-hand side, right? So that's the same equation that I wrote on the previous slides, except that there's this additional f. Um, and now, so here RST stands for regular regularity structures theory. It's somehow the, the theory that gives you that result. Um, so it tells you the following. So there's a recipe for, build, for associating to an equation like this, some combinatorial objects. And so in this particular case, it's sort of trees of this type where you have somehow uh, nodes with sort of pairs, uh, pair, pairs of nodes. So you have nodes of different types, some either round like this, or you have little nodes that have somehow thick thick lines, two thick lines coming out of it, and the, uh, so you have thick and thin lines, and so you have, and you have big nodes and small nodes, and the small node needs to have two thick lines coming out of it, uh, and otherwise any node can have arbitrarily many thin lines coming out of it, um, and the thick nodes come in pairs. Okay, so here the pairs are sort of drawn in the same color, and now that determines, if you want, you know, like a collection of somehow trees, but with additional combinatorial data with these sort of thick and thin lines and pairings of nodes. Um, and if you look at all the ones that have at most four, four thick nodes, then it turns out there's 54 of them. Okay, you can actually just count them. You can draw all of them. Um, and then it tells you, well, okay, so for each of those, it corresponds to a function, a, a way of building a function f out of the gammas and the sigmas, okay? Uh, and the way it goes is basically each thick node corresponds to a sigma, uh, each thin node corresponds to a gamma, and then the lines correspond to a pairing up of indices, uh, and the thick lines correspond to the sort of two upper indices, you know, of the gammas. And when you have additional thin lines, it corresponds to partial derivatives uh, of these functions, right? 
but it doesn't really matter what it is. It's basically a cooking recipe that for each of that combinatorial sort of thing uh, gives you a way of turning these gammas and the sigmas into a new function you know, from Rn to Rn. But these functions are not necessarily vector field. That's the point, right? So they, they are functions with one free index, but there's no guarantee that they would transform under changes of coordinates the way a vector field would transform, right? In the sense that uh, it satisfies, if you think about it somehow, the whole thing satisfies Einstein's convention, so you end up with something with one free index. Um, but because the gammas themselves, they are Christoffel symbols, so they are not a tensor, Okay, and partial derivative is not a covariant operation either, uh, so there's no reason for these things to actually give vector fields. So certain linear combinations would give vector fields, but not all of them. Okay? And now the theorem, what, which is a sort of special case of a much more general theorem, tells you that um, there's a way of choosing, so for each of these little symbols, you can choose a constant that depends on epsilon. So here what you do is you first you smoothen out this white noise, okay? So instead of taking the white noise which has delta function as its covariance, you replace it by something smooth uh, that has as its covariance like an epsilon approximation to a delta function, okay? So, so you replace the white noise by something that has a covariance that sort of looks like this where you have epsilon here and epsilon, well, minus three actually because in time, there's the time direction and in time you actually scale by epsilon square because that's the natural parabolic somehow space-time scaling, right? So you replace your white noise by something that has a covariance like this which is an approximate delta function and now there's a scale, now it's smooth so the equation is perfectly well defined um, and you have this parameter epsilon that you want to send to zero and of course, the smaller the epsilon is, the rougher the thing becomes, and in general, the whole thing just diverges, right? And so what the general theorem tells you is that you should actually add an f like that, which is a linear combination of these epsilons, which are these functions that are built from gamma and sigma corresponding to the recipes for each of these trees. Uh, and it's a linear combination with coefficients that themselves potentially diverge as epsilon goes to zero, okay? So the theorem tells you that there is a way uh, of choosing these coefficients, these C epsilons, so that if you modify the right-hand side by the correct linear combination uh, of these functions, then you actually get a finite limit, okay? Which is a, a pro and not only you get a finite limit, and the limit that you get is independent of how you regularized uh, the noise, right? So whatever shape this approximate delta function is, that would affect the values of these constants. So the way you choose these linear combinations here does depend on the approximation, uh, right? But the limit you get does not. Okay? So that's kind of similar to what we had uh, previously in, in our, you know, one of absolute value of x kind of distribution. Right? Um, and, okay, but now that's a priori, it's sort of nice, but it's not terribly satisfactory for a number of ways. Well, first, we had to actually modify the equation, and in the simulation that I showed you, I didn't have to do anything, okay? So that one would like to understand why in that particular case I can actually choose all these constants equal to zero in the case of the sphere. Um, and the other thing is that here, in principle, it's not canonical because in the theorem, also I had to at some point choose some truncation of the heat kernel and the things depend on this choice of truncation. Um, so, so the whole thing is not quite canonical, but the collection of solution theories is canonical in the sense that uh, if I choose two different truncations, uh, then again, the two solution theories differ by just changing the right-hand side with one of these finite linear combinations of these 54 specific terms that you know, come out of the theory. Um, so I don't have one single solution theory, but I have a 54 dimensional 
space of solution theory, which is kind of an affine space, because there's none of them which is more canonical than the others a priori, right? Then the other thing is that the general theory of which this was a special case knows nothing about geometry, right? So you do everything in coordinates, uh, and you just have no choice. Like intrinsically, the way things are defined locally, they, they are really defined in coordinates, and so there's no guarantee that, you know, if I write the thing in a different coordinate system, I actually really get as a solution the thing that I would get by solving in the old coordinate system and then just, you know, mapping it over with the corresponding diffeomorphism. Right? So there's no guarantee that the limit that I get is equivariant, the solution that I get is equivariant under diffeomorphism, right, in the sense that if I sort of push forward all the coefficients like the Christoffel symbols and these vector fields and maybe the right hand side, the additional vector field on the right hand side, I get the same thing as solving the original one just pushed forward by my diffeomorphism. Um, so now I have this 54 dimensional space of solution theories. Maybe some of those might be uh, equivariant under diffeomorphism, but you know, a priori, the theory doesn't tell you anything about that. And then the other thing is we had this choice of square root of the inverse metric, right, which is these sigmas. And again, we want something which is kind of canonical, which only uses the Riemannian data, right, which only uses the metric. And so you can ask yourself, you know, which solution theories are somehow invariant under, you know, choices of square root of the inverse metric. Again, so, and in either case, it's not clear that there's any of them. Right? I mean, these might be empty. Um, now, there's a kind of a fact, so I, I don't write it as a theorem. It's a theorem in all particular special cases that are of interest here, but the formulation is, is a bit different because it depends on what you mean by asymmetry and so on. Uh, but the general idea is that whenever you have any sort of symmetry, so in this case, there are two symmetries. There's the symmetry of being equivariant under changes of coordinates, and there's the symmetry of not depending on which square root of the metric uh, you choose for the noise. Um, and the fact is that if you have some way of approximating your equation that preserves a given symmetry, then there's also a way of choosing these constants to get a finite limit independent of the regularization which preserves the symmetry, right, which has that symmetry. Okay, so it's not completely obvious that that should be true, uh, but okay, it doesn't seem implausible either, and it's true in all the, all the cases um, of interest, and in particular in these two cases. Now, um, in this particular example, well, it's easy to, so the regularization that I mentioned to you, which is just uh, replace the noise by something that has a nice smooth covariance. So that one obviously is, that just turns the whole thing into simply a nice PD, uh, which is really D nonlinear heat equation plus this additional term, um, which is then equivariant under diffeomorphism, right? So that one preserves the first symmetry, okay? And so that tells me, so this meta theorem, if you want, then tells me that at least there are some solution theories that satisfy equivariance under diffeomorphism. Um, and one can do some dimension counting uh, and one finds that one still has 15 degrees of freedom left instead of the 54 that one started with, right? So, so actually out of this 54 dimensional affine space of solution theories, there's a 15 dimensional hyperplane in there uh, so that all the solution theories in that 15-dimensional hyperplane uh, are equivariant under changes of coordinates. Um, and then similar, there's a different way of regularizing the equation, which preserves this property that um, the noise doesn't depend on the choice of square root for the, uh, for the inverse metric. And, and then that gives you then solutions that have that symmetry and it turns out it gives you like a 19-dimensional affine subspace of solutions that have that symmetry. But, the, but we don't know of any way of regularizing it that has both properties at the same time, right? It's diff really different ways of regularizing the equation. And so you can't just mash both symmetries together into one big symmetry and apply that 
better theorem, right? Um, and in general, if you have a 54-dimensional space and you have a 15-dimensional subspace and a 19-dimensional subspace, and they are affine, all of the, right? There's no, these are all affine spaces. There's no canonical origin. There's no reason for them to intersect, right? 15 plus 19 is much less than 54. Um, but the, uh, the, the magic is that they do actually intersect, okay? So the, uh, and they, are, they intersect actually on a two-dimensional uh, space. So that's uh, this joint work with Ivan uh, from Gabriel and Lorenzo Zambotti from a few years ago. Um, which is, it is actually possible to have both symmetries simultaneously and so to produce uh, a canonical, like a stochastic process that is built purely out of the Riemannian data of the manifold, right? So you build it by choosing a chart, taking local coordinates, choosing that choice of square root and so on. But you know that there is a limit which doesn't depend on any of these choices. And there's actually a two-parameter family uh, in general. But in the, so this is in complete generality in the sense that even when, right? So here, the, the, the case that we're thinking about is the one where the gammas are the Christoffel symbols and the sigmas are a square root of the metric, and so they are related in some way. Uh, this is a completely general statement, which is true also if they are just arbitrary guys. In the case when they are related in this particular way, uh, this collapses to having actually just one degree of freedom left. So one of them gives you a counter term that's always zero. Um, and then the counter, this particular one degree of, so you think, what is that one degree of freedom? So that one degree of freedom is gradient of scalar curvature. So in the sense that uh, like two solution, two different solution theories that are on that same line, they differ by adding to the right hand side a term that's proportional to the gradient of the scalar curvature uh, of your manifold, okay? And that's something that if you want in the static case, in the case that if you don't build this dynamic, but you just look at the measure that should be the invariant measure for that dynamic, which is the Brownian loop measure, and then you ask yourself what should be a natural formal expression for the Brownian loop measure, and the first guess would be that it should be e to the minus the Dirichlet energy, uh, and physicists had already realized in the 70s that it's actually more natural to think of it as e to the minus Dirichlet energy plus constant times the integral of the scalar curvature along the loop. Um, and then there was a whole dispute, if you want, in the physics literature about what the value of that constant should be. Um, and it turns out that if you, different ways of formally interpreting the equation give you different values of the constant. And of course, here it's now clear why that is the case, is that there's really that is the one degree of freedom which just isn't canonical and really depends on you know, details of how you approximate things. You would somehow end up on a different point of that line somehow in a natural way. Uh, and then if you want your measure to be exactly the Brownian loop measure, you have to shift yourself to wherever the Brownian loop measure lives. Um, so, and that actually on the, in the static case was already sort of figured out by Anderson and Driver in 99, sort of in the probability literature. Um, so an interesting thing here is that actually there's even on this one parameter family, now there are actually two, two natural points. In some sense, there's this one parameter family of solution theories that all differ by a term which is a gradient of scalar curvature. Um, now formally, at least the invariant measure for these things should always be of the form Brownian loop measure with a weight that is of the form e to the constant times integral of scalar curvature. And so then there's a natural one, there's a natural origin, which is the model that really has the Brownian loop measure as its invariant measure. Um, but then there's also an, there's another natural model, which is, you know, remember the equation is like heat equation plus, then there's a nonlinear term with the Christoffel symbols, and then there's the noise. And now, if locally you're at a point where the Christoffel symbol happens to vanish at that point, which, of course, you can always make any point to be such a point by choosing the right coordinates. But say if the Christoffel symbols vanish at a given point, um, and that point is such that the derivative of these sigma vector fields all vanish as well, that means that locally at that point, my equation basically just looks like 
the heat equation with no nonlinear term and a noise that is basically additive. That it's really just a sigma times a, con a noise times a constant, right? So at least to first order, it looks like this. Then you'd think, well, that one is really nice. That's a nice equation, which we know very well. It's linear. We you know, know everything about it. So that shouldn't require any counterterms or any renormalization at that point. So you can ask yourself, is it possible to actually choose these counterterms in such a way that they necessarily always vanish at such point for both of the approximations that we looked at, right? So both the one that was equivariant on the change of coordinate and the one that sort of preserve, uh, preserved this sort of invariance on the square root, choice of square root of the metric. And it turns out that you can do that. So that gives you another natural point on this line, which is sort of the one uh, for which the counter terms sort of vanish at the natural points where they should vanish, right? So there's sort of here there's a kind of vanishing counter term points. And so, so we have this sort of line of solution theories with two natural points on it. And so you can ask yourself if these two points are actually the same point uh, or if they are different. And actually there's a conjecture that they are not the same and they differ by one over eight, okay? Um, and that's, uh, that's not quite proven yet, but it's, it's close enough to be proven that it's almost a theorem. Um, but I think I'm actually at the end of my time, so that's probably a good point to spot. Thanks. Thank you.